Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Google Hangout with the Buck Institute for Education. Glad you could join us. Wherever you are, it's 5 p.m. here in California at the Buck Institute for Education. I'm John Larmer, Editor-in-Chief, and I'll be joined today by three fellow educators talking about assessment in PBL. It's our theme for the month of April. Uh, all, all months, every Wednesday, except for the um, fourth Wednesday, we'll be having hangouts on the, the 9th, the 16th, and the 30th of April on the same topic, assessment in PBL. So um, this Hangout will last for about 30 minutes, and you can pose questions on the Google Plus Events page. If I can uh, work it in during the conversation, I will, or perhaps we'll save questions for the very end. And if we don't get answered, we can always answer the questions on the Google Plus Events page as well after the Hangout's over. Hangout will be archived, if you know people that want to see it later, from our website at bie.org. And um, let me introduce our driving question for today, and I'll introduce our guests. So the driving question for our Hangout today is, how can we effectively assess student learning in project-based learning? It's a tricky topic. A lot of teachers at our workshops struggle with assessment in PBL, uh, but we think we have um, you know, some good conversation about it today. It should help you with some answers. So I'm joined by some great guests. Uh, we have uh, Janet Bonds, who was um, coming to us from Florida, and she's an education consultant, but a former director of technology at a district and a director of a K K-12, is that right, Janet, or K-8? Uh, PBL school. Uh, K-12. K-12, okay, PBL school. And um, also Ian Stevenson, who is a member of our national faculty. Hey, Ian, coming to us from Seattle. He's a high school teacher. Yeah. And Erica Jordan, who is a um, uh, fifth grade, is that right, Erica, fifth grade teacher? Uh, no, I'm now an educational consultant. I was in the classroom where I taught fifth and sixth. Right, correct. right. Former teacher and now Former consultant. Educator. And you're in, um, you're in North Carolina, is that correct? Yes. All right. And just a word to our viewers, Erica might have to duck out to uh, attend to her, um, her infants. No, I should now be fine. So um, <laughs> if that happens, we'll carry on and hope she comes back quickly. So anyway, thank you, thank you all for being with us, guys. Uh, let me introduce our first question then. Our first question to talk about assessment. Just to sort of give a quick overview, what are some common assessment issues in project-based learning that you see? Dan, how about you? The most um, common issue that we found was the, that it took a lot of time in order to plan all of the assessments necessary for a variety of projects. We wanted to individualize assessments as much as possible, but it took a lot of collaboration between staff and a lot of time. Mm. Okay. Yeah, PBL does take time, especially when you're first getting going. So, um, and you're right, assessment is more complicated than that. You can't just do the same old test every time in PBL. Ian, how about you? What are some common issues you see? Gosh, I would agree uh, with Janet. The time is, is a big issue, um, but, but it's definitely worth it to put in the time. And a, a, Big issue also is the the individual versus group assessment and how to how to separate that out and and how to really balance that so that um, it's not just an individual driving the whole group work. Yeah, common pitfall for mm -hmm. parents as well raise that issue oftentimes in PBL. Erica, how about you? What are common issues you see? Uh, just to kind of add on to what Ian was saying, I often some common issues that really come come about more often than not is the individual and the group assessment um, and how you balance that and how are you assessing the content um, but in project-based learning there's such a big focus on the 21st century skills or critical competencies um, how do we assess those so that's a, a big thing is just how long you know how much time we do spend in putting building those assessments and putting those together um, and then how do we assess those individuals and how do we assess the team and, and is everyone pulling their weight how can we tell who is understanding the content um, and who still needs some more work and more assistance okay all right thanks Erica let's uh, some of that leads into my my the questions I thought of for this hangout then so the first one as you guys mentioned how can teachers assess an individual's contribution to a team created product so, Janet, how'd you handle that one in, in your experience? Well, one of the main things we did um, when we had a group of students on one project that each student had to create, that create their own 
goal sheet and talk about what goals they were hoping to achieve within that project. And they needed to do a timeline for themselves so they could kind of plan out the project in advance and um, each one would have specific roles and expectations that they were to meet during the project. And then they need to journal along the way and um, reflect on their prog progress. So they were, all had um, quite a few pieces they had to be accountable for. Okay, so lots of ways to, to track what individual students were doing. Okay. Uh, Ian, how about, how about you on that question? Yeah, I would piggyback on that, and, and I use a lot of, a lot of task lists and, and the team meetings as, as check-in so that I know along the way um, I, I can keep track of who's, who's been working on what. And the, the task lists, they need, um, they need some practice until students really get used to how to use them effectively. So I find that the task lists with some um, sentence stems driving sort of more reflective questions about um, not just what are they doing, but what resources do they do students need to get that part of it done? How much time do they think uh, it might take? Uh, what is their weekly schedule after school? Uh, if they have got, you know, um, uh, sports or music or other things going on, you know, when are they going to fit it into their schedule? And um, <clears throat> so those are really important to, and it's a, a living document that goes on and, and try and get, gosh, if I can get at least two check-ins with some team meetings um, on those task lists, I, that gives me a good idea of where they're at. And then some, um, definitely some self and peer assessment at the end of the project or even midway through. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, Erica, any thoughts on individual assessment in a team-created, team product situation? Yes. Um, I guess I, I, both points were excellent, and I'll kind of piggyback off of those as well in the sense that I, I too, did a lot, spend a lot of time meeting with the teams, but then also I may meet with only one student from the group um, because having roles student roles in their project groups um, was something to kind of keep them focused in on what specifically they were supposed to do. But one thing I also tried to do during projects is to have the students switch roles throughout the project so they're not always, um, you know, the recorder or taskmaster. Um, something especially in the fifth and sixth grade, um, time management is, is a skill um, that we all are still working on, but it's especially um, important at that age because they are, you know, they are getting more homework. They are building up a little more independence um, in the classroom, and so the time management piece is really important. That I make sure that I'm reinforcing with individual students within the group, but then also the group as a whole. So I really like the idea of having the team meetings. That was something that was really important on um, any project. But then also contracts. Um, Contracts are important. Um, I know that Jana had mentioned something about setting goals, or maybe that was um, Ian that had mentioned that, but students setting goals, but I think the contracts also hold them accountable to um, how they're going to handle or um, get over the hurdles that are going to come, you know, that are going to happen during the project. Um, I think that's kind of an area that has helped me work with groups, but also the individuals especially if one individual is really struggling. Um, and then we don't hear the, well, this person shouldn't be in the group because they're not pulling their weight. We've got the contract there. Right, right. Yeah, good point. Actually, that answered one of our viewers' questions. Cynthia asked about, a, is it appropriate for in middle school to have students actually create a learning team charter or let you call it a contract to assign roles and create agreements on how to work together. So, yes, Cynthia, as Erica said, it's a great idea for elementary school students, too. Absolutely. All right, let's go to our next question, Okay. Um, which talks about how can teachers assess content knowledge in a project. I should say that we're going to talk about assessment of 21st century competencies, the four C's, skills, uh, in a hangout later this month. So for this hangout, I want to talk about how do you assess content knowledge in a project context. So uh, let's go in the same order. Uh, Janet, what do you think about that one? Um, most of our teachers still use a lot of traditional assessments. You know, they use quizzes and checklists and reports and um, demonstrations, those types of things. 
but we're using online resources a lot more, um, word walls and um, webs, concept webs, and the polls and the surveys. Uh, a lot of online resources have helped us um, a lot to see what kind of content the students can put in and give them, engage them a little more on how to show that to them. Okay, thanks. And Ian, how about that question of content assessment? Uh, yeah, definitely the, the traditional assessments are still still have a place, especially uh, my focus in humanities. Um, you know, a quiz or a, a short test is a great way to, to get at the facts of it. It's a real quick way um, that usually happens earlier in the project while they're, they're building the knowledge, which then they'll apply later in the project. Um, I also use a lot of, of mini presentations, um, sort of as a, um, it's also going to practice their skills for the communication and, and uh, presentation skills. And, um, Ian, excuse me, during the presentations and those practices you mentioned, mm -hmm. are you assessing content knowledge during those as well, or is it more just about the presentation skills? It's, it's the content knowledge. You are, okay. Yeah, and, and so the... Yeah, the, the presentation skills, it's just it's just sort of practice time to get over that initial fear and get used to, you know, what do they do with their hands when they're standing there kind of thing, or how do they practice without staring at their notes. Um, but definitely content, and so there's got to be some specific guidelines of, of what's expected. And, of course, it, it's not going to assess all that they know, just a quick snapshot, and then maybe I'll finish up with, uh, you know, a whole quiz, you know, at the end of the class kind of thing. Okay. Uh, Erica, any thoughts on content assessment in a project? Um, that's an interesting concept, the mini presentations. I have to think more about that, um, Ian, because I, I like the idea of, of having mini presentations to, one, help them with the skill, but for the content knowledge, um, assessing the content knowledge in the mini presentations. Because I would agree with what both have already said, is that there needs to be a blended approach, the formative and the summative and still some traditional and possibly maybe more non-traditional um, forms of assessment. Um, I also like to make sure that the content uh, as applicable would be on the rubric, such as if, let's say, uh, debate. Um, and so you, in a debate, you would have the communication skills that you may be assessing um, or being able to debate and, and pose you know, a statement and supportive evidence, but then also you should be able to state so many facts or some additional information that's relevant to the content. So I think making sure that content is in the rubric um, as well. Um, it doesn't always work in every rubric, but I think it definitely has a place in rubrics. Okay, uh, we had a question for you about this. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Ian, go ahead. I just want to point out real quick that, that um, the, as, as Common Core is, is used and students are learning that more and more, that that's part of the content knowledge as well. And so I, I use a lot of um, the Socratic seminars and fishbowl variations um, to, to assess that those Common Core skills. Do they have the evidence from the text and are they using it and can they point to specific language in the text? To, to defend their point that they're making uh, in, in the student conversation. So um, if they're all using the same text, you know, I, I know what they should know. And, um, and it's also then good practice for them communicating to each other and, and collaborative conversations, so. Okay. Uh, quick, questions from, quick questions from a viewer. Uh, Deb asks about uh, the use of proficiency scales. Um, like a level one and two is teaching content specifics. Uh, with perhaps low-level quizzes, and then moving on to level three, where with the I can statements, and really start the inquiry process. Does anyone else use proficiency scales? Deb asks. So, anybody want to chime in on that one? Um, I can indicate that we use um, a proficient, advanced, and mastery scale in terms of how they're doing in their project. We correlated those with Bloom's taxonomy. So um, some of the lower level blooms with um, knowledge and classification would be a, more of a proficient level. And um, then if they went into like doing a Jacob's Ladder or something more extensive in a project, that would be a mastery level. And that's how we would evaluate the amount of credit that they got on their project was um, whether they did it at a proficient advanced or mastery le level. And the kids some at the high school level had a choice because they may 
want to really go in depth and explore something at a mastery level, but only really be happy with a proficient level at something they're not all that interested in. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, let's go on to our next question, and we've mentioned this a little bit, but let's talk about how should teachers use formative assessment uh, during a project? I'll go in the same order. Janet, you want to take that one first? Well, the biggest thing that we tried to accomplish is to make sure that um, we weren't doing just a one-shot assessment process. We wanted to make sure that teachers were giving as much feedback as possible to the students along the project timeline. So at the beginning, they would have opportunities to brainstorm and um, do different lists of things that they were looking at and then continue to do journaling along the way and logging, maybe some quizzes in the middle. Just a whole continuum of things, so there's plenty of times to check in with them and make sure they're on target and they're not you know, floundering around. That's the, the main um, idea is to keep in touch with the students throughout the time. Okay. All right. Thanks, Janet. Ian, how do you handle formative assessment in your projects? Yeah, I think that, that diversity that Janet spoke to throughout the project is, is really important. And um, a, a diversity of, of sort of formative strategies, um, you know, not just all the discussions or not just all the journals, but really balancing it out. And, and I, I, I go back to the team meetings a lot um, because then I'll know hearing, you know, listening to the students, I'll know where they're at and, and what their knowledge is and can do some almost instant differentiation and, and, and shoot some resources, you know, to a student one way or I know, okay, those four need to come out and we're going to do a little, a little workshop tomorrow because uh, they're really, they need more support in one area or they're, they're not quite figured out some of the skills. Um, so the team meetings, are a, are a powerful formative assessment process as well. Okay, thanks. Erica. Um, my philosophy with formative assessment, whether it's project-based learning or, you know, if, if you have a traditional classroom um, or traditional methods, is really that the student has to be actively involved in it. And so formative assessments, um, again, reiterating what has already been stated has to go on throughout the project whether that be in journals um, whether that be through a variety of strategies of conversation um, it may just be little quick snip the ticket out the door whatever it may be but the student has to be able to understand why and what target they are trying to meet and why it's important that they understand how to um, carry themselves during a presentation and, and so that's why having those meetings and those conversations with groups or individuals are important or understanding why the rubric set states this is meets the expectation and then the next level exceeds the expectation so kind of going back to proficiency scales and, and using those rubrics throughout the project or throughout the process is important for the students to really be active participants with the assessment and saying, okay, here's where I'm at. How do I get to the next level? How do I close those gaps? So what do I have to do to get up to the next level um, and move up the continuum? Because that is, again, the reason behind a rubric is so that they can see where they need to go. Um, and so I think when it comes to formative assessments, we have to continuously use those rubrics and continuously have the students be a part of the assessment. Okay. Thank you. Glad you mentioned rubrics. I like to, I like to write rubrics. It's kind of an odd thing to like to do, but I do. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Erica. Yeah, um, I think I do. I, we have the same problem. We both like to write rubrics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it takes all kinds. All right. So our next question, uh, and this one I think I might ask you to just offer um, quick tips on because the minutes are ticking by. So just a couple of quick tips on on, on the use of self and peer assessment in a project. And I'll start again with Janet. Um, we use rubrics and checklists that we um, introduce to the students ahead of time so they know what they're looking for and have some input from them um, if changes need to be made. The final grade is often a combination of a peer assessment, a self-assessment, and then a teacher assessment. And another thing that we did is we um, sometimes connect with schools in a different part of the country um, virtually and have students in, in the other school 
um, check work of our, our students so they don't really know who their evaluator is and it takes that personal kind of stigma out of it. <laughs> yeah. I like that. That's a great idea, having students in some other place give each other feedback. All right. Mm. Uh, Ian, how do you use self and peer assessment, or what are some tips you'd offer? Um, I I learned some good uh, some good tips um, to make um, a peer peer review of writing really effective, and which was which was breaking it down into real small chunks and quick rounds where okay we're just looking at uh, at periods now and, and you go through somebody's writing and correct the periods. Okay, we're just looking at capitalizations. We're just looking at indents on paragraphs. So really breaking it down to the the real specific um, noticeable um, uh, areas that, that students can point out to each other is really helpful. And um, definitely the, the self-assessment is, is powerful a lot for the, the 21st century skill, the collaboration and communication. So I don't want to get too much into that, but, but they can really be honest about themselves. And I guess with this too is, is that I, I found to just really trust the students, you know, ask them and, and if they realize that you really want to know, then they'll tell you and they'll be honest. All right, good tip. Erica? Um, I agree. Students are harder on themselves and each other than I often am. Um, but what's interesting, I think, with the self and the peer assessment is establishing a rubric. To It's amazing what happens when you build a rubric with your students mm -hmm. um, and when they set the expectation. And so one of the first rubrics I ever create with a new group of students is a collaboration rubric. And we go back to that, um, kind of like what Ian was saying, is we may just say, let's just pick one portion of that rubric to self-assess today. How did I do with um, communicating effectively with my group? Um, or we may say, OK, I'd like you to assess and have a conversation with your group members on how um, they worked collaboratively together. Um, and so making sure that we're reinforcing um, and modeling for our students how do we self-assess and how do we peer assess. And, and I've found it's really been helpful when we actually build a rubric, when I build a rubric with my students because they understand what it means. Um, and that's a, a good entry point. And then because we've started that, um, we've made that a part of how how we function, it makes it a lot easier when we self and peer assess, perhaps using a content rubric or a rubric for content or um, some other skills. Okay, and this just occurred to me. You can then use when they use the rubric to self assess. You can assess their uh, the the Common Core skill of of reading informative text and and using evidence from the text to. to there you go. <laughs> All right, the rubric can be a text. That's right. <laughs> All right, we had a, a, one of our viewers offered a tip. Um, uh, Peggy George mentions that she really likes the 21st century template created by Sylvia Tolisano, languages for students to use throughout projects. So at lang languages.org, we, we can post that link uh, on the Google Plus events page. Languages, L-A-N-G-W-I-T-C-H-E-S dot org. Okay. All right, um, let's go on to our next question then, which is the, uh, the really tricky topic, and it's a swamp. We can't get into it very deeply in, in a couple of minutes here. So again, some, some quick tips or thoughts on how teachers should handle grading of project work. Well, um, we started using Project Foundry in our school, um, probably one of the first school districts in the country that started, started using it. And a lot of our grading is um, utilized with the management of Project Foundry because the kids do their journal journaling and their logging and um, all of the project proposals and the teachers can do that. So um, that tool has allowed us to kind of manage that um, component. We also have used Edmodo quite a bit. Edmodo allows a teacher to set up groups and um, put out surveys and quizzes and polls and then they can grade it within Edmodo and the students go in and see their grades. Well, that's been a really useful tool for us to um, on the screen. Okay, yeah, thanks. I like Project Foundry and Edmodo a lot. So, Ian, how about your thoughts on grading? 
Um, I find that that this is a, a definitely a tough one, and and a lot depends upon um, the expectations of of the district where the teachers are teaching, and expectations of the school. Um, you know the that. Uh, and, and how much freedom the teacher has to to create and define the categories in their own grade book, um, and and it's got to start there. And and the more that there can be agreement between teachers at the same school to use the same categories, that will reinforce it. Um, and then a lot, um, if you're still using points, which most most schools tend to still use points. Make sure those are overlaid with the rubric. I really like how Erica keeps bringing up those rubrics. So, so have your point spread, you know, throughout the rubric, so the kids can see. Oh, a, a 12 is actually this middle column in the rubric, rather than just a, a innocuous number. Okay. Uh, Erica, thoughts on grading? Um, I completely agree. It is. It really does depend on where your school and. Um, where you're at as far as what, um, how grading works and it's, it can be a tricky um, conversation because every place seems to have a different theory or um, background on it. So I would I really used a lot with again I go back to the rubrics because I had points in my rubrics for each column um, and I kept it very simple four three two one. A, B, C, D, <laughs> and zero was not completed. But I, you also have to really kind of go through and and still um, your project is going to have for grades. It may have several grades in there, um, not just for content, um, but maybe also for um, some of those competencies as well. So it's really laying it out um, so that the students can see where that that number comes from because I know that's a conversation that parents often want to see where that grade is coming. So it has to be laid out ahead of time before the project even is launched um, in the sense that because there are going to be questions on it um, and then you know maybe in your school or in your classroom that's not a factor but more often than not in classrooms I've worked with it's 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 a a hot topic and so to have that all laid out ahead of time really is helpful for the student for the parent um, and then for me too to see am I where am I waiting um, possibly something that um, needs to be assessed more okay all right uh, believe it or not our half hour is almost up so um, We'll have to leave the grading question there on the table. There's a lot more to say about that. If you have questions, as I said, folks out there, you want to pose them on our events page, please do. Um, and now I'd like to give a couple of takeaways that, that we picked up from the conversation today, and I'll, then I'll come back to our guests and let them have a, a final word or a goodbye. So we, we talked about diversifying assessments throughout a project, so a variety of assessment strategies, and not just at the end, but you know, certain kinds at the beginning and in the middle and, and near the end and after the project presentations perhaps as well. Um, Erica mentioned modeling expectations and, and making sure students understand the criteria for assessment through uh, demonstrating what, how they should act by showing models of products perhaps they're supposed to create, um, perhaps using rubrics to help model the expectations too. And Ian pointed out uh, and also, uh, Janet, I believe that traditional tools are fine to use in project-based learning. They're in the context of a project, but you can still use quizzes, tests, homework assignments, the things the teachers always use to assess both individual individuals and content. And um, we talked about the use of self and peer assessment, which is a great way to increase student voice. It's one of the elements of PBL is student voice and choice, so by having students involved in the, in the assessment process, it helps give them that that voice. Okay, so let's come back to our guests for a final word. Janet? Um, I just want to say that um, assessment has, this diversification of assessment has meant so much to kids. It really gives them an opportunity to shine and to get help along the way and results in the, the best product or project for them. Okay, thanks. Ian? But yeah, I would say uh, especially for teachers that are that are newer to PBL, um, you know, 
it, it can be hard to decide, but but make a choice of some new formative assessments that you're going to use, and and make your summative as authentic as possible. You know, make a choice. Figure out what your intention is. What are, what are you really trying to assess? And and you know, try it out. See how it goes. Reflect on it when it's over, and uh, and then you adjust. Okay. Go for it, Erica. Um, one of the statements that we use often in BIE at BIE with projects is it's the main course, not the dessert. Um, and so I, I take that into assessment as well. Is it's a part of the main course? It's not the something that happens after. Um, and so I think that's one of the points that I heard with all of us today is that we have to use the assessments formatively and summatively throughout the project um, and not just at the very end. Um, and I think that really assessment is not that scary of a, of a thing. Um, it shouldn't be that scary of a word um, in the sense that if students know what's expected and we're doing it throughout, there are no surprises at the end. Um, and, and so that's why I kind of go back to the it's the main course, it's not just what happens at the end, the dessert. Okay. Nice nice summary statement there, Erica. Thank you. Um, well done. All right. Well, thanks to our guests for joining us, and thank you, viewers, for joining us, too. Uh, thanks, as I, <laughs> thanks, Janet. Uh, it's great to have um, uh, all of you out there asking questions. You can ask more, if you like, on our event page, like I said. And uh, we hope to see you next week, uh, April 9th, same time, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, for a hangout on the topic of performance tasks, which are going to be part of these assessments for Common Core, the Park and uh, Smarter Balance assessments, uh, how you, you can use performance tasks in the context of project-based learning. So we hope to see you then, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.